Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Summer of Carnage right here on the Venom Vlog. And today we're going to take a step back and look at an old Carnage story. And it's not that old actually, uh, but I did want to get in some other Carnage stories that weren't current uh, during our Summer of Carnage, obviously, because uh, we're not doing a Carnage week, you know, this time and this season. We're doing a whole, you know, summer of Carnage storylines. And so there was a couple that, you know, kind of slipped through the cracks we didn't talk about before that I wanted to get into. And uh, I decided that there's not much to say on this Axis stuff, like I reread it again just the other day and I was like, you know, there's not a ton to say about this. There's a couple of key moments, but there isn't a bunch to talk about. So I figured, you know, cause Carnage isn't in like the main Axis book that much. And uh, and then the other stuff, he's only in for like a couple issues. Like his, he has a three issue miniseries and like he's in two issues of Nova and stuff. So I figured we'll do it all in this video. So we'll have this, like this will be one long video and it'll be broken into three sections. And each section will talk about a different chapter of the Axis storyline that involves Carnage. So here we have Axis. I have all nine issues of this series. Uh, during this time in like the early or like I guess 2010s, early 2010s, getting into the mid 2010s, uh, Marvel was doing this thing where like they just and they still do it kind of to this day, where it's just event after event after event, and uh, and it gets frustrating and it's it does you know it does damages to our wallets. But mainly the way they do that is that's their business plan is hey. We're going to pump you full of stuff. You know you love our characters. Come buy our characters. Who cares really? Even though they'll say till they're black and blue in the face, they're just like, we put a lot of work into this. And it's like, yes, I'm sure you all put a lot of work into it. But still, a lot of these events still suck. So, uh, so, and, and some of the ramifications just don't last. Um, Axis was one of those where it had a few ramifications that actually lasted one of them up until very recently with Sabretooth. So I give Marvel at least some credit on that one. Uh, they committed to Sabretooth being a good guy after this event. And we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, but a lot of these times, these events are like, this will change everything. And while that event's going on, some other event's going on that apparently is going to change everything. And then a year from now, you kind of forgot what was changed or what matters. And uh, like I said, this one, though, still had a couple ramifications, one of them being Sabretooth, that just recently uh, changed. So that's uh, I'll give this book a little bit of credit for that. Uh, also, I do like Rick Remender. He's the one who wrote this. Marvel was also doing this thing where every event was done, done, you know, done by a different writer, someone that they propped up and, and made big at that point. But Rick, I felt like, really earned it like whereas bendis like his early stuff maybe earned him some um you know leeway in the beginning but after a while i just felt like they were just throwing him work just because he wanted it you know and he was like phoning it in most of the time whereas rick remender did a lot of great stuff indie stuff also like bendis did uh but also remender did um you know this amazing run on uncanny x-force and a lot of people really hold that to a standard like as far as x-force uh, books go and as far as x-men titles go i thought it was a great book it had you know dealt a lot with deadpool uh wolverine apocalypse being reborn in uh you know archangel's body um there was a lot of really cool stuff there's a love story between archangel and psylocke that was building up that they you know from before that they started to like you know the tie in those threads again uh you know here and in, in that storyline and uncanny x-force and at the end of that everybody was so blown away that i think even marvel was like all right we can't ignore it this guy's definitely made a name for himself he took like this small book like uncanny x-force which probably would have sold anyway because of the characters that are in it but still like he wrote a really great story and it lasted like 35 or 30, 36 issues and marvel was like let's give this guy a major book so they gave him an avengers book called uncanny avengers and he was like let's like let's actually have humans and mutants work together in the spotlight and actually try to save xavier's dream because this happened after bendis's uh you know everything changes event uh where it, it kind of did a little bit um but then the, immediately in this one they bring xavier back but in the avengers vs x-men which was the event before this one um we had Xavier get killed at the end by Cyclops, who was possessed by the Phoenix Force. And so there's some ramifications dealt with in this one, but ultimately most people are like, eh, it's water under the bridge, Cyclops, Let's as long as we're fighting side by side, that's all that matters. And you're just like, what? And so like, you know, this thing where they do in movies where they take these indie filmmakers and writers and uh, and directors, and then they give them like a big tentpole movie. Um, and then sometimes it falls flat on their face and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, that's kind of what Marvel's, you know, does with some of their writers they are like, all right, this guy propped himself up. Rick Remender made a big name for himself. Uh, so let's give him a big tentpole uh, story and let's you know, influence stuff and let, you know, a lot of, once you, when you write an indie film, you can kind of have like your own say in it and you work with a smaller group of people. When you 
get to do a big book like Avengers X-Men Axis, obviously you got to deal with other people uh, with the story. You got to go up higher in the food chain and you have more, uh, you know, chefs in the kitchen basically. And I feel like a lot of times that hurts these books. And I don't know, I mean, that's just my speculation, but I, you know, just from my personal opinion, this is one of the weaker things Rick Remender has written at Marvel. Um, but as for event books go, it's not half bad and it has some moments in it. I just wish it wasn't nine issues dragged out with like three different artists or four different artists. They had uh, Adam Kubert did some of the issues, uh, Lionel Francis Yu did some, Terry and Rachel Dodson did some, and then Jim, Chang, uh, Jim Chung came in on the last issue with all the other artists so they can get it out semi on time. I think this book was a little late at, towards the end um, but uh, I, I hated that too because these artists all have different styles different tones and they were like well that worked great on Avengers vs X-Men it's like uh, did it though because uh, I didn't think it did uh, so I don't like I, you know I like one voice you know one tone one style um, it's like changing directors you know every act of the film and uh, and that could be jarring if it's not written in a, a structure that allows for it and this one kind of is and kind of isn't but unfortunately they change every like two issues and that's definitely not how it's structured it's definitely structured in three issue increments but then yet every two issues they change artists so it gets a little frustrating in that regard because you can't even complete an arc with one artist before the next artist comes in uh, so that made this a little frustrating to keep up with too <laughs> Uh, but I've talked a lot about behind the scenes. Let's talk about the book itself. There's not much to talk about. That's why I went a little in depth on my opinions about behind the scenes stuff. Um, in this book here, this was one of the first books that used this AR tech. I think also Avengers X-Men did, uh, where you scan it with your phone and it added like extra chapters or extra pages or something. Nothing really that impressive, although I think the concept is great. I'd like to see them revisit it now that AR tech is a lot further along um, and see them do actually interesting things with it nowadays. Uh, but still, you know, it added a couple extra pages and gave you some stuff. Um, one of which I think was a Nova page because in this apparently they reference in the Nova storyline that he shakes hands with Carnage in this event. But in this actual book, in these pages, I don't see that. Maybe it was in some of the AR stuff and I just missed it. Uh, but I don't see, I didn't see it in this where, where Nova and Carnage even shared a panel together, uh, let alone a handshake. So I think that might have been in one of the AR pages, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, but the storyline here is that the Red Skull has now been killed by Magneto, but his consciousness survived somehow and merged with Xavier's consciousness after Xavier was killed. And, you know, they like because after Xavier died, uh, Red Skull took his body and uh, he stole it from the heroes and like dissected his brain and started studying his brain. So after, Ma you know, Magneto kills, even though everyone tells him not to, he kills uh, Red Skull and that just enacts his plan even further. And it turns him into this big creation called the Red Onslaught. Um, and then of course, because he's like a Nazi, he wants to pu purify humanity. He wants to wipe out mutants and amongst other things uh, and any, you know, humans with enhanced strength, I guess too. And he starts coming up with this plan. He builds two, uh, he uses Stark's uh, info that he got, the data he got from when uh, the Civil War, when he, you know, had all the heroes, um, their datas and their, their plans on how to take them down and everything. Like Batman style, he had all that on a disc, and I guess he, you know, ingested that or downloaded that somehow, and knows everything that Tony Stark knows. So he built two adamantium sentinels uh, with that technology, so he could uh, help destroy mutants that way. And it's like, yeah, but are you forgetting the mutant who killed you? can manipulate metal. So it doesn't matter that it's adamantium. Uh, Magneto can still rip these things in half, which at one point he does. He rips one of the heads like right in half. Uh, so the, it's not, I don't know, that some of it's, uh, I guess, thought out a little, but not really. Um, but Red Skull has this big, you know, vague plan of like wiping everything out using these two Sentinels and using his new powers as the Red Onslaught. Obviously Onslaught being the, uh, when Xavier once wiped out Magneto's memories and took away all of his memories and left him kind of comatose uh, in a way. He he absorbed all of his memories and the merging of, the, of his powers with Magneto's memories and Magneto's powers, I guess, uh, turned him into Onslaught. And he became the traitor that Bishop was sent back in time to stop. It was Xavier the whole time, not Gambit like they originally thought. So that was a pretty neat storyline for the most part, Onslaught. I mean, it didn't have a big payoff, unfortunately. Uh, but it, but then when all the heroes sacrificed themselves to stop Onslaught, we thought that's what was going to happen here. Because last time Onslaught popped up and it was in the mind of Xavier... Um, you know, the, it took all the heroes to fight him and beat him or to and sacrifice their lives. And they got sent to like an alternate universe by Franklin Richards in order to, you know, save everybody. So it, it cost a lot. It took all the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, Hulk, Iron Man, all of them. And they all disappeared for like a whole year and stuff. So, um, 
the stakes were high last time. So this time people you know, were like ready to make that sacrifice. So they all go in and they fight him and uh, he wins. Red Dawn starts winning. And so what happens is, uh, you know, they think Dr. Doom and Loki and Dr. Strange all team up in, in with Scarlet Witch. And they come up with this spell, this inversion spell that will uh, reverse the thought process of Red Onslaught. So it'll awaken the Xavier mind and it'll make the Red Skull mind go dormant. And so by doing that, they're inversion. It's like an inversion. Like they're inverting him, inverting his thought process, turning him to a good guy, essentially. They do that. And of course, like all these things, like a bunch of amateurs, I don't know how they always screw this up, um, but th it goes wrong, <laughs> of course. So they, they end up turning Xavier, they give him back control of the Red Skull's body. So it's Xavier's mind in Red Skull's body. How horrifying is that? Um, and then uh, while that happens, though, some of the heroes, like Sam Wilson, who at this point is Captain America, um, you know, he and Steve rogers has grown older um so uh so it's very familiar to the ending of endgame in that regard where it's like an old man steve and uh, passing the shield along so sam wilson is in charge of the avengers and he and iron man and some of these other heroes get inverted also and they become evil and at the same time magneto and carnage and hobgoblin and Sabretooth and mystique and all these villains and absorbing man all these villains that came in to fight the battle because they were like hey well you know what do we got to lose i mean this guy's trying to kill us too red onslaught's trying to kill us too so we'll get involved all of them get inverted and turn into good guys so that leaves us with good guy carnage a carnage that actually wants to do good things he still has dark thoughts but he's able to suppress them or or they make him sick thinking about it so he tries to do good things and that's really all we have to talk about in this storyline is just that carnage goes around you know trying to save the day and he teams up with Sabretooth. Sabretooth kind of becomes a de facto leader type uh which is really great uh, they do this rick remender clearly has a love for wolverine and Sabretooth and these characters because the last issue is definitely big time dedicated to Sabretooth changing his ways and wolverine you know at this point in the comics is dead uh, so it's Wolf, you know, it's Sabretooth trying to live on with the legacy of uh, of Wolverine. He's going to become, I guess, you know, he's going to live in Wolverine's uh, image in the sense that he's going to do right from now on. Because at the end, he doesn't get reverted back, uh, and neither does Havoc and Iron Man. And those characters go off in some of their books to continue being evil a holes. Uh, whereas, like I said, Sabretooth, like Iron Man, Havoc, all them, they got turned back pretty quickly or, or writers forgot all about it and just abandoned those ideas. Um, but Sabretooth, up until recently with Weapon X, Greg Pak uh, Greg Pack wrote a Weapon X storyline that lasted like 30 issues or something. And uh, and it wasn't until the final issue where Sabretooth f full on becomes evil again. So that just happened. This book came out maybe like five or six years ago or something like that. And just now, or maybe a little longer ago, I can't remember. And just now, uh, Sabretooth is back to being a villain again so that's that's pretty good like at least it worked for Sabretooth so Rick Remender's last letter in here of like hey I really want Sabretooth to be a good guy that lasted for a good long time so uh so at least they stuck to that but everyone else kind of went back to the way they were including Carnage uh but before Carnage does he does get a big play in this for the most part it's just him coming in he swings in he fights a couple uh bad guys um uh, you know a couple good guys obviously too Apocalypse is now reborn through the body of Genesis which was like this little kid who was like a reincarnation of Apocalypse that uh, Deadpool was trying to keep an eye on so there's a lot of heart there and that's what I liked about Rick Remender he actually tried to give a heart to Deadpool and try to write him not just be the jokey guy but actually be sincere at times and I kind of like that version of Deadpool and so uh, when he did that in this you know Deadpool saw Apocalypse and he's like no you're, you know you've turned back into Apocalypse I was supposed to save you I was supposed to prevent this from happening and Apocalypse like, yeah, you know, I'm inevitable kind of thing, like a Thanos thing. And he like rips Deadpool's head off. And uh, and it's pretty gruesome. But, uh, but the storyline ends with all the X-Men, you know, having to fight, uh, you know, Apocalypse. And everyone's inverted and all the good guys are fighting each other. And the bad guys have to come in and save the day. And then meanwhile, uh, you know, Thor and Loki get into a fight. And Loki's able to lift Thor's hammer because they've both been inverted. So Thor's the villain now. He's not worthy of the hammer anymore. And, uh, and Loki is. And so he picks up the hammer and beats the crap out of Thor with it, which was pretty awesome. Um, and then he gets reverted back, obviously. So there's a lot of great moments in this book. Uh, I don't love this story. And like I said, I feel like it's stretched really, really long, a little too long for my taste. Uh, but I think it has some great moments and it definitely some good fan service in there. And just some moments that you're like, oh, that's kind of cool to see, like Absorbing Man absorb some metal and fight Apocalypse. It's like, all right, that's a cool thing to see. Um, you know, it's not it's not like mind blowing or anything, but it is kind of nice to just see, see these cool moments 
between characters that don't normally exist and fight each other. Um, and then all the stuff they did with Sabretooth and, and you know him sacrificing, trying to sacrifice his life to save Mystique against Rogue, that was a lot of fun. Uh, but then Carnage, he gets the big play at the end, like I was saying. Uh, he There's a bomb that's going to go off, and it's going to a genetic bomb of some kind, and it's going to wipe out everyone that's not a mutant or whatever, and this is Apocalypse's big plan. So it comes down to this big bomb thing, and meanwhile, Doctor Doom, Scarlet Witch, Doctor Strange, and Loki are all trying to once again undo the inversion. So they come in and they invert everyone back. But like I said, Sabretooth doesn't go back. He stays a good guy. Um, uh, Iron Man prevent, he did something where he prevented him and Havoc and a couple others from converting back too. So anyone in his little bubble got protected and Sabretooth just happened to be in there. So Iron Man continues on as a bad guy at this point, which doesn't really matter because between Avengers vs. X-Men and this one, Tony Stark's kind of written like a piece of crap anyway. So when he became, they're like, oh, he's a villain now. I'm like, now he's a villain uh, he's kind of been a scumbag for a while now in the comics um especially in so, since civil war really if you want to argue that point so uh so i was like yeah i'm not really feeling this like who cares that he's evil because it's you know he's already been acting like this anyway um so he goes off and does his own thing but uh but carnage right before the inversion happens carnage and spider-man are stuck in the room with the bomb and Car and spider-man's like all right i'm, I'm gonna do this we got to stop this bomb and carnage says let me do it and he's like, what? And he goes, I've done all these horrible things in my life. I've done horrible things to my family. Um, you know, I got my dad to kill my mom. I, I pushed my grandma down the stairs. I killed our family dog. Like, I've, And Spider-Man's like, geez, dude, like you are an awful person. And he's like, I know. He's like, so let me, Carnage, be the one to do this. Let me make the sacrifice play because I don't want to, if I get reverted back, I may feel guilty about all doing all that stuff. Uh, I might still have the good in me. And he goes, and I don't want to live like that. He goes, so let me do this. So he wraps a symbiote in himself around, which is funny because you don't really ever get the symbiotes POV on this. I guess the symbiote's mind was also inverted too, um, but you never really get, so that's, I uh, kind of struggle with the writing there. Plus, Rick Remender goes full-on redneck with uh, Cletus Cassidy because the name Cletus, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, but Cassidy's Irish and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, but the way it's spelled and his name is Cletus, like, you know, I, I, I guess a lot of people assume he's from the South. Some writers, like, I don't think originally he was meant to be that way. And I think some writers come in and just translated him that way. Rick Remender is definitely one of them. Uh, you know, Cletus Cassidy is full-on, like, when I do this Spider-Man and I die, I want you to... Build, I want a statue of me in New York City in this stupid liberal city, you know, and I want a statue of me with the Confederate flag hanging over me and Freebird playing, you know, uh, nonstop at my at my statue. And uh, Spider-Man's like, what? And he's like, he's like, just promise me you'll do it. And Spider-Man's like, fine, I promise you. And Spider-Man ends up getting that made somehow. Like, I, I don't know how he got it made. I can't remember. But uh, there is, there was for like temporarily, there was a statue that was golden that played Freebird that had Carnage <laughs> with the Confederate flag go for him um amazing stuff right <laughs> uh but yeah so anyway uh that's that was his big play and then he gets blowed up uh but of course that's not the end of him he doesn't die in the storyline we thought he did maybe uh but he does come back in a nova comic book but before we get into the Nova comic book we should go back a little bit to a storyline that takes place right before and during this event while carnage was inverted <laughs> So the second book we're going to talk about is Carnage Axis, and this was a miniseries that was three issues. It was written by Rick Spears, and uh, the artist was Jermaine, I think Jermaine uh, P uh, Peralta. And the art is amazing in this book, and Rick Spears does a really good job. I'm not too, too familiar with Rick's work, um, and I think I even in a previous video accidentally credited this miniseries to Kevin Shinnick, uh, which Kevin did the Hobgoblin story that if you buy the graphic novel that has Hobgoblin and Carnage, uh, you know, miniseries all in one graphic novel. And that's what I had, so that's why I think I was thinking Kevin's name uh, during this. Uh, but Rick Spears is actually the writer of the storyline, and it brings back the Sin Eater, um, I think it brings back the original Sin Eater. There's a lot of debate to be had here, a lot of discussion. I know um, uh, one a viewer of this show in particular will have a lot to say about this, um, but uh, it, it, I, I struggle with it. And I'm sure there's Rick Spears interviews out there. I'll have to try to like look them up, or if you have any out there, um, you know, let me know in the comments down below. Put a link down there. Uh, but uh, Rick Spears, his approach to this was, okay, this is going to be set. A little bit before and then like and right at the moment of inversion for uh, Carnage. So during the big Axis event, you know, they had the big fight going on, but there was enough time in there for Carnage to run off and do like a side adventure. And that's what this is. That's what this miniseries is. And uh, this three issue story basically has Carnage versus Sin Eater, but he's also trying to be good and you go through his life and Rick does a really good job. Did 
clearly did his research and referenced a lot of things. So I could see why Swordsman, uh, the viewer I'm talking about, is uh, so adamant about this being actual continuity because Rick Spears does such a great job referencing continuity in this storyline. He shows, uh, you know, the moment Cletus killed his family dog, uh, the moment he, uh, you know, tricked his, you know, dad into killing his mom, basically, because basically, I think what happened was uh, Carnage's mom or Cletus's mom tried to kill him um, originally, and then, and then, or he, she, she tried, he tried to kill her in the tub uh, by throwing like a hairdryer plugged in into it. She lived somehow and came after him, and then it showed, and then like the father showed up and like saw her attacking her son, and then out of defending the son, killed the mom, and then went off to jail. And I guess he was like a drinker and he was kind of a bad guy anyway. Um, so, so they show some of that in here. They also show the grandma getting pushed down the stairs at one point into the cellar where she died. Uh, so they show a lot of the history of Carnage in this. So this is a really great revisit of his history uh, and his origin story and it's written really really well and, uh, and and besides that there's this new character named Alice Gleason who's like a reporter and Carnage sees her on TV and he believes she's a good person because she wants to get to the truth she's a journalist who wants to get to the truth right and um, and obviously she turns out to be kind of a scumbag journalist uh, towards the end but then again who needs to be nice to Carnage he's a monster so you really have kind of like oh it's a lot of gray area characters in this one uh, but uh, so Carnage takes a liking to her and he's like I need you to teach me how to be good how to be a good person and she's like I I'm not I don't want to do this and he's like come on so he kidnaps her and he's like asking her what should I do and she's like well a hero would do this and uh, and stop that bank robbery so he goes over kills the guy like takes the guy's gun who's robbing the bank shoots the guy to death with it and then throws his car into the bank and then shoots the gas tank on the car and blows up the car and the bank and then he turns around and goes there you go and she's like what are you doing and he's like well, if there's no bank to rob, then there's no bank robbery. <laughs> and so he's got like this really warped sense of justice. He's like, look, I did good. So even when he's do when he's inverted, doing like he thinks he's doing good, and his body and mind are saying, do the right thing, he's still doing horrible stuff. That's how far gone Cletus Cassidy is. And that's what I loved about this series was like there is no salvation for this character. Like they, they, they in this one, Rick does a really good job just really showing how much of a monster Cletus is just through actions, not even like through di certain dialogue and stuff. It's like through actions alone. Although there is great dialogue in it and great moments where, you know, Cletus sees himself as a little boy and he's got like a spider carnage mask on and he's like, you know, having memories and, and things like where he thinks he's like, I'm, I can save Alice. You know, she can be my Uncle Ben moment or whatever and she can be, I, I can save her and uh, I can't let her die, you know, whatever. And he's doing all these things and it's, uh, it's really great. Rick Spears does a great job. But what he does is he brings back the Sin Eater, but he does it in a really unique way. This Sin Eater is some kind of specter. It's some kind of, you know, animated corpse from hell or something. Uh, it has a flaming skull, almost like Ghost Rider style. So when he's wearing the ski mask, he takes it off and there's a skull there and he's able to absorb souls and sins. So he's literally eating sins. Uh, so it's a really cool interpretation of Sin Eater and, uh, and a very literal one in a way. And so as he's eating these sins, he you know grows more powerful, grows stronger. And there's a moment where he kidnaps Alice Gleason, the reporter, and brings her to his like little sewer base that he has. Uh, kind of reminds me of the Punisher live action movie with Dolph Lundgren uh, there's like this little room and then there's like newspaper clippings all over the the tunnel and uh, and if, while she's looking at it she's seeing holy crap and she's starting to piece things together and she goes are you Emil Gregg and she goes are you the actual guy that Eddie Brock said was the scene leader but uh, you know but everyone like according to like Spider-Man he caught the cop that turned out to be the Sin Eater in the the death of Gene DeWolf storyline and stuff um it turns out he caught the real Sin Eater and Emil Gregg was the guy calling Eddie Brock claiming to be the real Sin Eater I still feel like that's continuity like that is like maybe Emil Gregg is was the second half maybe there was two Sin Eater killers uh, originally um, because obviously we know Emil Gregg I think dies later on in the comic books um, but like when they did the Sin Eater a second time and they had a second guy become we thought it was Emil Gregg but it turned out to be someone else uh, like in the uh, homeless shelter with them or something like that so it, it's hard this is the debate right this is the, the swordsman is going to come in and have this debate with me I'm sure and I would say neither of us are probably wrong I'm, I'm sure Rick Spears intended to kind of uh, rectify uh, Eddie in some way. Like, hey, let's add, now that Eddie is kind of more of a hero, I think at this point he was anti-Venom and stuff, like let's actually give a win to Eddie Brock. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know his thought process. Maybe that's what it was, uh, because that's what she said. She goes, are you Emil Gregg? But 
my my counterpoint to that would be that the sin eater does not answer her. He just keeps quoting things, quoting scripture, talking about stuff, which is something Emil did, sure. Um, and then also something the other sin eater did as well, the the cop killer, uh, the the cop who was the killer too. Uh, so it's it's like I don't know, it's on the fence because uh, sometimes I say don't believe villains, right? Um, even though she didn't like the villain here kind of in a way is Alice. She's a liar. Uh, you know, they reveal at the end because the carnage says you're a liar. And she goes, yeah, I am. So what, you know? Um, so it's, it's a coin toss. Like, can you really, she's piecing together something. Is she connecting the right dots? We don't know. The sin eater doesn't confirm it or deny it. So we don't know. So it's, it's a, it's a little like on the edge there. You're like, ah, I could go either way. So I would say swordsman argument of saying that this retcons, uh, that Eddie made a mistake, I would say that's a valid argument and it, and I can't argue against it because I would say there's enough evidence here to maybe suggest that. But I would also argue that my point of view of like, you can't really trust these people or trust the dots she's connecting or we didn't get confirmation. I would say all that kind of plays into that, you know, my theory of Eddie still cutting corners to make a mistake and being a flawed character still works for Eddie. Um, so I, I would say this is one of those instances where you can have your cake and eat it too. Whichever version you you know personally feel, I guess, is the right one in a way. And although I don't like moments like that, because I like Eddie Brock being a flawed person. If he was right about Emil Gregg, it takes away some of his flaw. It takes away some of his arc and his his road to you know doing the right thing and and you know having a broken sense of a moral you know moral compass, a broken compass in a way you know trying to figure out what's right and wrong. I like that because I find that more interesting. And those are the more interesting Venom stories. If you do this and fix it, it kind of takes a little bit of that away. Not a ton, but a little bit in my eyes. Um, so I don't know. Swordsman, you let me know what you think down below. And everyone else, let me know what you think. Do you think that this senior, Sin Eater is actually Emil Gregg? Because he's he's a spirit. We don't really know what he is because he eats you know, Carnage's sins at the end. That's how Carnage beats him. He feeds him all of his sins and saves one last one for last, which fills him up. He, he grows into like a 20 foot tall uh, man. And then he gets in and he explodes from eating too many sins from Carnage. And then Carnage is like, hey, I've been absolved of all my sins. Now I feel better. So if I get inverted, maybe I'll still be, you know, a good person or something like that, which we find out is not true at all. But then when he goes back to Alice, she's like, yeah, get away from me. Cops, you know, all the cops are there. And she's like, shoot him, shoot him. And he's like, I'm trying to save you. And they're shooting at her. And then she shoots him with like a shotgun and blows his head apart and it heals back up. And and uh, he's like, why are you shooting me? Why are you doing this? And, and then he's like, all right, fine. I guess if I have to be a hero, I got to do it on my own. And he swings away, you know, kind of left alone at the end of the storyline. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts down below on the Sin Eater thing. Um, the Alice thing, you know, she's an interesting character. It was neat to see her. You know, she's not a damsel in distress and she does play uh, Carnage against himself a lot in the storyline. So she's very capable and smart. Um, but, uh, but it does end where he, on a sour note, where she lies. So you're like, all right, well, you know, although she has no reason to lie about the Emil Gregg thing, but I think maybe she's either connecting the dots wrong or I don't know, she's just making the wrong assumptions about who this specter is. We'll never know. All right, and last I want to talk about is this Nova versus Carnage storyline. So after Axis ended, uh, Nova had a couple issues. Like one of them in this graphic novel, I think the first two parts are Nova versus Hulk, who in the inverted version of Axis, he's called Clue or Klu, uh, K-L-U-H, it's Hulk backwards. And he's like a bigger, meaner, you know, more demonic looking Hulk. And so, uh, so you know, first he's, you know, fighting there. And this story is written by Jerry Duggan. And the art is by David Baldion for the Hulk storyline and John Timms for the Carnage storyline. Uh, but the, the Carnage storyline is the one we'll focus on. But at the beginning, you know, Jerry Duggan does a good job setting up Nova and having him fight Hulk and then having him win, but his helmet gets damaged. And the reason I mention that is because that plays into the Carnage storyline next. So Sam Alexander is the kid who is Nova and he was in the Axis storyline there was a moment where Spider-Man had to save him because uh, the heroes like Lord all you know Lord when they were inverted no one knew yet they uh, the Avengers called everybody at Avengers Tower and lured them all there and then tried to like you know take them and invert them as well but Spider-Man Spider-Sense warned him and he was able to get himself and Nova out of there in time which then they went on to you know team up with the villains to come back and you know save the day in the end and we know what happened to carnage obviously he made the big sacrifice play uh but sam we never really saw what happened to him after he got saved by spider-man he had one moment where he went and fought hulk and then that carries over into his book but then after that we're like what happens after well i guess jerry duggan was like well i want to tell a carnage story with it 
And this is where I kind of, I'm like wondering where that moment happened because in this they reference that Nova says, you know, I think I did shake Carnage's hand at the Avengers or at the tower when all the heroes were inverted and we had to go out and save the day. But I don't remember finding that panel. If somebody does remember, because I went through the book, uh, like all nine issues of Access looking for it and I couldn't find it. So I'm wondering if it's one of the AR pages where I had to scan my phone and unlock it that way or if it's one of the side stories or something. Whatever it is, let me know because I think I completely missed out on that one. And I apologize because I obviously I want to make an in-depth video here but sometimes I'm going to miss things and that thankfully that's where the discussion part comes in and you guys come in because you can let me know down below what I missed. Uh, but this storyline is not very major. Not a lot happens in it. Um, you know, Carnage shows up. He, basically his motivation is, hey, Sam, you saw me do good things and I'm trying to erase anyone who saw me do good things, uh, you know, during the Axis event. So you saw me do good stuff. And I'm like, well, I feel like Alice Gleason uh, is probably higher on that list than Sam is. And so is Spider-Man, who Spider-Man literally saw Carnage make the sacrifice play and built a statue in his honor. So now that that's all done, I guess, I guess Carnage went and maybe torn down that statue now because he's like, you know, you know, I guess that reminds him of when he was good. Uh, but I don't know. Did he kill Alice? He certainly didn't kill Spider-Man. So I don't know why Sam's on his so high on his list over those other two characters. Uh, but whatever, he shows up here and he's like ready to kill Nova, he thinks Nova is Sam Alexander, which obviously he is, but Sam does some things in the storyline to throw uh, Carnage off, uh, even though Carnage goes and kidnaps his mom first, and then Nova shows up and beats him up, and then he's like, wait, you saved that woman pretty fast. Maybe you're Sam Alexander, her son. So then he goes and tries to, you know, attack Sam Alexander at school, but then he finds out he was wrong, and, you know, and Nova shows up to fight him, um, even though there's another kid at school named Sam Alexander, and the teacher's like, yeah, there's a ton of Sam Alexander. It's like, you just got the... Maybe he's like, maybe you got the wrong one. Like, so, and then Carnage is like, shut up, teacher. And uh, and then he, you know, proceeds to fight uh, Nova. And that's pretty much what it is. And Nova's helmet is glitching out this whole time because it was damaged during the Hulk battle. So uh, so sometimes Nova has the power to fight Carnage. And then in the middle of the battle, it, you know, he might short out and he'll be back in civilian clothes. So it's kind of fun that you know whole dynamic. But really, Carnage is just like you you saw me do nice things and i want to i want to kill anyone who saw me do nice things and it's like yeah well i'm sure sam isn't the highest on that list because i don't even remember a moment in access where they even met and sam barely even remember he's like oh, i think i shook his hand once whatever so it's like okay well that's it then <laughs> so so why is he so high on the list i don't know uh, but jerry duggan still does a good job writing the story uh the characterizations of these characters are great uh you know cletus is very deadly in this one he does a lot of cool stuff with the symbiote and there's a uh, really great fight scenes and john timms are with the battle scenes is great i love john tim's stuff i haven't seen him do too many things i'd love to see where he's uh working on now but i like his style it's very it has like a fresh cartoony kind of style to it and it worked for a character like nova uh so hopefully he's still around doing comics because uh the art in this one was good and david baldion did a great job too during the hulk one uh but yeah so that's it there's not really much to talk about nova beats carnage at the end and then uh you know saves the day <laughs> So that's it for this Axis storyline. I mean, those are the three parts. We had the first Axis main book, which was like, you know, these nine issues here. And uh, I didn't talk too much. I didn't want to like review or discuss Axis itself. Um, I, I mean, I talked about some of the behind the scenes stuff, but you know, there's a lot of story moments in here that just didn't involve Carnage. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of our focus right now. Maybe we'll revisit this. Um, I, I'm thinking about doing a Patreon like podcast for X-Men uh, and just go back and read old X-Men stuff and uh, focus mainly though on Wolverine and Sabretooth. So if you guys are interested in that, let me know in the comments down below because you know, I, I guess at some point I got to at least try to make a few dollars at this because I've been so broke lately and I love doing this for free. It's it's fun and I don't mind doing it for free um, because I love it, you know, and I love talking about this and Venom, Carnage, all that stuff. Uh, so the show, this show will, will remain on YouTube for free. You guys watching it gives me the clicks and stuff and, you know, sharing it and all that stuff. All that helps, you know, commenting helps, liking, disliking, all, you know, as long as you're discussing things with me and engaging with me, that helps the show. So, so that I'm already happy with. With. Uh, but I was hoping, you know, maybe to get some of these back issues and some of these other things I want to talk about. And then some of them already have, a lot of them already have actually. Um, but I was, you know, hoping, yeah, maybe I can make a few bucks and just do like a Patreon where you just pay, you know, two or five bucks a month and you get one episode a week of this, uh, you know, X-Men Wolverine Sabretooth podcast. And I'll either, you know, watch the, one of the movies and, and talk about the movies, like the X-Men movies, or I'll watch a cartoon episode, or I'll review a comic book, you know, one of their own series or one of the X-Men that has them in it. Um, 
I'm still brainstorming stuff. So if you have any ideas about that, let me know down below. And if you're be willing to subscribe to a Patreon on this show to support, you know, because I would just use that money to support all the shows that I do. Uh, let me know what you think of that idea too. If you think it's still too early, because we tried this before, didn't really work out. Um, so I understand completely. I mean, it, you know, I'm still growing and I don't want to put the cart in front of the horse as it were. So, uh, but I just would love to hear your thoughts on it. So just let me, get, you know, know guys. So that way I know how to proceed with the X-Men storyline and the, and the X-Men episodes I want to do. But maybe we'll revisit this when we talk about Sabretooth stuff and we'll go more in depth since it kind of does focus a little bit on Sabretooth, especially in the last issue. Um, so yeah, and then we talk about Carnage Axis, Rick Spears, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that down below, especially you Swordsman. And I, I kind of know where you stand, but I'd, I'd love to still have a back and forth with you a little bit if we can. And then Nova versus Carnage. I mean, not a major event there, not a lot happening. It was pretty much just them two fighting and Nova getting the upper hand at the end. And he was kind of clever about some of the fighting that he did too, which was kind of nice to see. And uh, he does get the upper hand on Carnage and Carnage gets arrested and taken away at the end. So that's, you know, these storylines um, are going to lead us. We got more stuff coming up with Carnage, uh, not just, you know, obviously the current Absolute Carnage storyline that we're talking about, but there's other stuff like Superior Carnage and Minimum Carnage. But I think Minimum Carnage, I might save for neck, even though Superior Carnage, I think, came out after Minimum Carnage. I can't remember which order they came in. I might still do Superior Carnage next. And then there's also like a Carnage versus X-Men or Fantastic Four storyline. I think it's X-Men. Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, you know, coming up with Ben Riley and stuff like that. So we'll probably get into that uh, in another episode when we go to do a flashback. Uh, but we have more Absolute Carnage books coming out this week. So I'll focus on those first. And then we'll get to the Superior Carnage and the, you know, versus X-Men storyline. But Minimum Carnage, I might say for next season, because the next season is mostly going to be about Agent Venom and Flash Thompson. Um, and then also the last of the Eddie Brock anti-venom stuff. I'm going to save all that for next season. So we got a lot of plans, a lot of things coming up. Uh, more movie news I'm sure will be coming out soon. So I'm trying to save some episodes open for that. And then we'll also talk about some new news that we got from New York Comic Con about Venom the End and uh, and some other you know Venom storylines that are coming up, uh, you know Venom Island and things like that. We'll probably do a separate episode coming up very soon about those as well. So make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss out on a single one. And yes, I am having trouble talking today. So and this has been a long episode already. So I'm going to cut this now. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think of this episode down below and we'll continue our conversation down there. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.